Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this uh, fine Sunday morning? We're doing well. I hope you guys are. <clears throat> if you are a, a visitor with us today, uh, we just want to give you guys a special welcome uh, and just let you know that we're excited that you're here. Um, and uh, one thing that we'll ask of you is uh, in the seat back in front of you, you'll notice that there's some cards uh, and uh, it asks for some information. If you wouldn't mind filling one of those out uh, and just uh, putting it in the offering box that's just outside those double doors uh, after the service, we just want to get a record of your visit and uh, we're not going to spam you or anything. We just want to say hi and, uh, you know, just get some information on you. So <clears throat> we would uh, love for you guys to do that. If you are uh, a returning member or, you know, guest, Thanks for coming back. We appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, this morning, if you guys would, wouldn't mind standing with us, uh, and we're going to sing some songs and worship our Lord. Amen? Y'all sing with us. Here we go. Sing, oh, great is our God. Oh, great is our God. So we should worship Him. No song is too loud. No orchestra to sing. To hail the majesty. So let your voices loud as we sing. Sing it out. Oh, great is our God. So let our songs be blessed. So awesome is ways. How could we comprehend? So we will make it known to our kings, and we will sing about the gracious gifts you gave. We will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will. Because our God is great, oh, great is our God, and we cannot keep singing. We sing from our souls, affected by His greatness. His mercy covers all that He so in this holy and his grace, we will sing your grace and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is God is great. We will sing your grace and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. Amen. Come on, give it up.
all sing with us. Sing that praise. truth of that song, um, just talking about how the Lord almost can fight for us. This is kind of what it talks about. Uh, and we praise him through that. We'll see him break down every single wall. We'll see all the giants fall because fear cannot survive when we praise him. Amen. And so this morning, as we continue in worship, as we continue praising the Lord, um, we're going to sing a song called Do It Again. And simply put, I mean, the message of the song is just knowing that his promises will never fail us. That even though it might feel like we may not feel him sometimes, that maybe uh, we're at a point where we just are tired. And the Lord can speak to us 
still. He can do the mighty things that he's already done already again. Amen? So let's worship him in that. Come on, y'all sing with us. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall but you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won But you have never failed me yet Promise, promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail me.
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Sing it out. Great. we thank you that you've never failed us. Jesus, you never will. God, help us to rest in that. To rest in that and know that no matter what, we can always come to you with all of our concerns, all of our hopes, all of our joys, all of our tragedies. Lord, we can come to you and know you'll hear us and know us. May we find rest in that. God, we thank you for this morning. We just pray it in your name. Amen. 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 It's good to see you all here today. God bless you for being here. You know, our God is a faithful God. Amen. He is so faithful to us. You know, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And uh, this weekend... In the United States, we honor the men and women who have died in the service uh, for our country. And, um, you know, their sense of patriotism uh, compelled them to put their life on the line. And uh, this, is, this is huge because whether they volunteered or whether they were drafted, they joined in the defense of our great land. And, and many times they traveled to faraway places to support other countries in their fight for freedom as well. And so they risked their all, and they died. You know, in a survey taken a few years back, only 28% of Americans understood the true meaning of Memorial Day. 28%. Slightly over a fourth. The day, unfortunately, has become more about retail and celebrating the beginning of the summer season and, um, you know, picnics rather than understanding the importance of remembering and the solemn celebration that it should be in our lives. See, it's a day of remembrance, remembering the sacrifices that were made to pay for the freedoms that you and I enjoy. See, we take so much for granted. Freedom never comes easy, nor is it free. We need to remember those who paid so much for our liberty I also remind you today that just as we are indebted to those who died to make our freedom possible, we ought also to thank God for his son who died to set us free from the bondage of sin. Amen. See, on this day, we have much to be thankful for. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And Father, as we remember those who died in service to our country, we thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you that we have the opportunity to sit in a sanctuary dedicated to the worship of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom that we have to to worship according to um, our own hearts and, and the way you lead us to worship. I'm thankful, Father, for the freedom that we have to gather and just to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful that we can do that. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross for each one of us. When we sing about the freedoms that we have, when we sing about the grace and your faithfulness, God, we are thanking you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross to free us from sin. Father, we thank you so much for your indwelling Holy Spirit, and I pray that even in this moment, Father, that your Holy Spirit would would cover this place, and Father, that our hearts would be turned to you, Lord Jesus, that our hearts would be turned to you, God, as the author, the giver of life, the one who has done it all for us. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in this time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, this morning for the next half hour or so, I'd I'd like to share with you um, a Christian concept of labor. Um, I think this is important. You know, many years ago, there was a uh, television ad on, uh, on the TV that suggested that each person should sign his or her name <laughs> to their work. You know, one guy, he repaired a fender on a car and he painted the words repaired by and then he signed his name to it. And, you know, I, I think if we did that, we would probably see a lot more respect for the work that people put in. But others followed his example. But you see, understand that in our society... In our society, work has lost its dignity and meaning. See, many people no longer take pride in their work. And in some ways, it's become a meaningless activity just to provide food or or housing or clothing for us. It's something, it's a means to an end. And I, frankly, I enjoy manual labor. Um, You know, some of you are like, man, he's crazy. I enjoy getting out and working hard. I enjoy breaking a sweat. I enjoy those things. I also enjoy studying. I also enjoy preaching. And I enjoy ministering to other people. Helping them out in their time of need. Helping other people accomplish their goals. But one thing I am completely aware of is being a preacher or being a painter. Both of them are sacred work. No matter what you do. You see, the Bible makes no distinction between the secular and the sacred. Think about that. I mean, this is one of the greatest results of the Reformation. You know, the Roman church in the Middle Ages pictured the the church as a ship sailing toward heaven with priests and monks aboard. And laymen... Normal, everyday people had to swim or be towed by the ropes attached to the ship. And so many, of course, drowned in a vain effort to pursue the vessel of salvation. The Reformation changed this. I mean, justification by faith alone liberated people from slavery of the church. You didn't need the church to save you because Jesus Christ alone saves I love that. Flowing right out of that was the priesthood of every believer. No longer did you have to enter a monastery or or become a priest in the church in order to serve God. Every believer is a priest. And every occupation, every calling, every vocation is sacred. See, Christ calls us to live in this world and not to run away from it. And every preacher and every custodian 
both, they glorify God in their work. Doesn't matter what that calling is, doesn't matter what that occupation is, it brings glory to God. I love that. Christ calls us to live in this world and not run away from it. You know, Martin Luther, he said this. He said, if this truth could be impressed upon poor people, a servant girl could dance for joy and praise and thank God. You see, in our society today, we hear a lot. We hear a great deal about wages. We hear a great deal about benefits. But there's a strange silence concerning the quantity and the quality of our work. We want all the money. We want all the benefits that go with it. But what if we're not putting out the work that we should be putting out? The quantity or the quality. See, if we work for, say, you know, from age 21 to, say, 65... 40 hours a week. Some of us put in a lot more than that. 40 hours a week for 50 weeks of the year, then we will work approximately 90,000 hours. 90,000 hours. If this much of our lives is spent in activity that does not bring real satisfaction, if it does not bring a sense of accomplishment, then the consequences of that will be devastating. What have we spent our life doing? See, work, work is not optional in God's economy. And I would submit to you this morning that everyone should work. Everyone should work. Obviously, someone in every family has to bring home the bacon, okay? Sometimes it's the husband, sometimes it's the wife, sometimes both. But just because someone is a good provider does not mean that the other one does not work or does not need to work. Moms, if you have young children at home, you have your hands full with plenty of work right there. If there are no children in the home, work can be done outside the home. Maybe volunteer work or even support your husband in his work. College students, high school students, they should, they should work too. I mean, I would say at least during the summer, but probably during the school year as well. And there's a, a, a variety, you know, there, there's very few students that don't do better in their studies if they have a part-time job where they work as well. But wait a minute, I'm not done. I also believe in child labor. Yeah, we raised five children. Any parent who does not give regular chores to a child is depriving that child of an invaluable experience for his or her future. See, I believe everyone should work because I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Even retired people should work. I don't want to leave anybody out. I mean, there's nothing about retirement in the Bible. We think about retirement, and, and you know, there's, it, it, it's a product of the Industrial Revolution, and it's turned out to be both a curse and a blessing, retirement. I mean, the blessing is obvious. I don't begrudge anyone if they have the financial security just to, um, you know, retire from their career while their health is still good. But pity the person who uses that opportunity to vegetate in front of the television and putter around with no clear purpose. That's not the purpose of retirement, isn't just to, to do nothing. You see, I've known many people who have literally wasted the second half or the fourth quarter of their life because they equated retirement with stopping work, and a good number of them have even died prematurely, and I suspect that their body just couldn't adjust to the work stoppage. Please understand, I'm not saying that a retired person has to start a new career and work 60 hours a week and all that stuff. Many of you that have retired are probably busier now than you've ever been. But you know, it's good for us to find meaningful, steady work of some kind, hopefully kingdom work. 
and make the second half of this life really count. See, I have both great sympathy and a word of encouragement for those who may be unemployed. I sympathize because nothing is more damaging to a person's ego, especially, I want to say, a man's ego, than unemployment. It's what you do. It's it's how you identify yourself. And my word of challenge is this, is is that if unemployment continues for a lengthy period of time, take a job, any job. Do something so that you can have gainful employment because it seems even more demeaning when when that, that lack of work goes on longer. And it's always better to work at something that that gives you gainful employment. You're doing something. And and so don't just keep waiting, you know. I mean, humanity was made for work. And the person who works is always going to be healthier. They're going to be happier than the one who does not. And this is important because work doesn't have to be for pay in order to be meaningful and productive. I mean, volunteer work is as noble as paid work, especially if a person is disciplined in it and regular at it. And I would say that work in the home is a very noble thing Maybe more noble than work out in the marketplace. Especially because you're shaping and you're, 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 you're forming young lives. You're making a place where uh, people can come and get rest. Now I want to say something here that, sounds, that may sound harsh. But I believe that it is supported by scripture. Refusal to work is sinful even if theologically motivated. I mean, 1 Thessalonians says this. Paul writes this. I'm going to get to my text in just a moment. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11 and 12 says, And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and to work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly towards outsiders And will not be in any need. Paul instructs the church in that way. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to work with your hands. And listen to this. He says work here has two primary values. One, it protects your reputation so that you won't become a busybody. So that you'll have something on your mind. That you'll have something that you're doing. And secondly, it keeps you from becoming dependent on other people. You see, every time we take a handout, a little part of us is given up. And the more we do that, the more we give up. And the more we become dependent on others. See, God did not design it this way. Yes, we need to help others. Yes, we need to be there to help others. But folks, we need, to, we need a hand up, not a hand out. And I think that's a, that's a huge difference in our society. So what does the Bible say about work that could give it dignity and purpose? Let's look in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, I want to read two or three verses here. Verse 23, 24, and 25. If you have your scripture and you just want to open up to that. Colossians 3, 23, 24, and 25. Paul writes this. He says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done and that without partiality. I want to encourage you this morning. Just a few, few thoughts here along this line. Paul says, whatever you do. And I just want to say, do the job that's assigned. You know, if you have an assignment, then do what's assigned. And so I, I love this because at, at, at some point, you know, one of the first things Paul writes here is he says, whatever you do, <laughs> whatever you do, he expected Christians 
to be engaged in meaningful work. Whatever it is that you are doing. He warned the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. He said this, he said, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Listen, God has made an investment in our lives. And he gave us, he gave us gifts. And we glorify him when we use the gifts in our work. Whatever it is that we do, we are honoring God. So I love this when he says, whatever you do. And I want to, secondly, I want to say this. Do the very best you can. Whatever it is that you are doing, do it the very best that you can. You know, at some point, some people brought up accusations and, and charges against the Apostle Paul. They brought those charges up, but you know, he was never, ever charged with being half-hearted. Whether he was preaching the gospel or making tents, he did it with all of his might. He did the very best he could. He put his whole heart into it. And when you work, and your work is done in the spirit which Paul encouraged, work will take on a new meaning. You're putting yourself into it. You're, you're, you're pouring into it. And the, the philosophy that is expressed by many people today, you know, this philosophy of get all that you can with the least effort. Folks, that is doomed to failure. You know, it's like... Many of us could relate to the businessman who had to let his associate go. He had to let his associate go, and, and so a friend asked, you know, where's Ken at? And he said, well, he's not here anymore. He said, have you filled the vacancy? And he said, uh, when Ken left, he didn't leave a vacancy. I mean, I hope that's never said about us as believers, that we can lose our job and there's no hole to fill. It means that we're not doing what we're assigned to do. We're not doing the very best that we can. I mean, how often do we hear the words, he or she doesn't really put their heart into it? Oh, for every failure, of, for lack of ability, there are a thousand for a lack of heart. So that's why Paul says, whatever you do, do your work heartily. Heartily, literally, it means from the soul. Do your work from the soul, from the core of your being. And this is where it all comes down to. Whether you're a wife that may be stuck in a, a marriage that is making you miserable or an employee whose boss is making your life miserable, the fact is, is that your submission and your work is ultimately for the Lord. See, the way we should look at it is like this. You might sign my paycheck, but God is my boss. And therefore, I'm going to do the best job possible. You may never give me a raise, but I'm going to store up treasure in heaven. Therefore, I'm going to be the best employee this company has ever had. That's what it means to work heartily. Put your best into it. The very best you can. I would say also do it to glorify God. So who do you work for? Who do you work for? I mean, the secret of noble living and meaningful work lies in our recognition that we are working with God to make the world better. We are working with God. I don't care if you're a plumber. I don't care if you're an electrician. I don't care if you're a, a substitute teacher at school. I don't care what it is that you do. You are doing that to work with God to make this world better. It's huge. Listen, it's a bad testimony for a Christian to be lazy and deceptive in their work especially while on the clock. I mean, if we agree to work 
for a set time and receive a prearranged wage, we're expected to fulfill our end of that agreement. I mean, God's not pleased with those who seek to take advantage of others. He's provided for us. And whether we like it or not, our lives are a representation of Christ in everything we do. I mean, his work on the cross was not done to please men. It was to glorify and honor the Father. His body was not offered in order to reconcile him to the Father. But his body was offered on the cross to reconcile us to the Father. He carried the sin and the shame on the cross in a way that honored God. And you would think that we would be able to work in a job in such a way that pleases him. Think about this. He didn't gripe. He didn't complain. He wasn't bitter. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and the shame for you and for me. I don't know. I feel like a lot of times, if things don't go our way, we just want to tell everybody about it. See, the key is this. You have to figure out who you work for. Figure out who you work for. Maybe you heard about the boss who was not getting as much respect as he felt like he should at work, and, and so he was... Uh, kind of complaining about it in a staff meeting and later that morning he went to a, a local sign shop and he bought a sign that said, I, I'm the boss. And he put it on his office door. And then he went to lunch. And when he came back from lunch, there was a handwritten note that was taped to the, the little sign on his door. And it said, your wife called and she wants her sign back. <laughs> you have to figure out who you work for. You see, sometimes we're just serving people. And we worry a great deal about what people think. And we worry about whether the boss is going to recognize what we did. If we're going to get credit for it. If we're going to get recognition somehow. And really, that's what's on our mind. We're, we're serving other people, but we're wondering what they think and how, if, we can, if we're going to get recognized for that. And sometimes we're just serving ourselves. I mean, if I'm only looking out for myself, me me, me, then I want to be sure that I get that raise. Then I want to be sure that I get that praise. I want to, I want to, I want to make sure, you know, but maybe we can be bitter at other people who are successful. And so we work harder to, to show them up, you know. Or maybe we don't work at all and just stew in our own resentment. You're serving the wrong master. You ought to be serving the Lord. I love this. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, Joshua said this. He said, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve, whether the gods of which your fathers served, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. See, understand, according to this passage in Colossians, your rewards come from the Lord. See, if you work for people, then the only place you can expect reward from is your human boss. You know, Larry Burkett, he writes this. He says, it's interesting to note that the workers whose bosses praise them most highly are usually the ones who require the least praise. It takes a lot of energy to remember to praise someone for everything he or she does right. What a joy it is when a boss finally finds a quiet, efficient self-starter who continually looks after the interest of other employees. These qualities are so rare that the boss is torn between promoting that person and keeping him or her at their present job. The fact is, is we're serving the Lord. And we ought to look at those opportunities around us to serve others as serving the Lord. 
He goes on to say, I found a common characteristic in Christians who don't rely on praise from others. They take literally the principle of work in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And the key is that they look to the Lord for their rewards. And in doing so, they find God's standards of conduct are so much higher than humanity's that they surpass any of their boss's expectations. See, if you're working for Jesus, then understand you'll receive rewards from him. You know, Jesus told the story about a master who had some servants to manage his money while he was gone. And this is what it says in Matthew 25, verse 19 and following. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Folks, that verse ought to send shivers through your spine. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves, those servants, came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you have entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. <laughs> I want to enter into the joy of my Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Yes, sometimes we get earthly rewards for doing the right things. And generally, you're going to find out that if you do the right thing, you may get promoted, you might even make a better salary, but not always. Our reward is not always going to come in this life. That's why it's important for us to understand who we work for. But it will still come. We will enter into his joy. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Amen. I say this, why do we serve the Lord? I'm almost done. We serve him because he loves us. He loves us. We serve him because he loves us. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. In, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 14 and 15, it says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul was saying that Jesus' love for him was the thing that drove him. It was the thing that motivated him. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, he said, If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. See, I can do some great things apart from love. But it doesn't do anyone any good. But we understand his love best when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ. He died for us. John, 1 John 3.16 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, if you haven't opened up your heart to Jesus Christ yet, serving the Lord sounds crazy. But once you have opened your life up to him, and because of his great love, because of his amazing grace, because of his mercy, I mean, praise God, we're not going to get what we deserve. But he loved us, and he made a way for us to be reconciled to him. When someone loves you like that, how can you not love him back and serve him? 
It's beyond me. I know that what Jesus Christ has done in my life has changed my life tremendously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here doing this. I'd be doing something else. But understand this. Because of his great love, that's why I'm here today to tell you about that. So that you too will work for him. Not for men, not for employment, not for all this other stuff, but that you would do your work for Jesus Christ, that you would do it the best you could. And on that day, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to my joy. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word, and I thank you that you loved us so much. Even when we were in our sin, even when we were disrespectful, even when we was shaking our fist at you, that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin, that, Father, I'm not going to pay the penalty for that, that he took the, my sin and, and the shame of that, and he, he conquered death and he conquered hell so that I could be reconciled to you. Father, I thank you for what you have done for each one of us in that. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit today would search our hearts and see if we too are found in Christ. Your word says that if we are in Christ Jesus, we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Father, what that means is we've got a new boss. It means we work for you. And everything that we do is for your glory. Father, you have gifted us in, in magnificent ways. And Father, when we use those gifts to honor you, we are glorifying your name. Father, help us to see that. Help us to see that in the home. Help us to see that in our work. Help us to see that as we serve others around us. Father, that we are not just serving people. But God, we are serving our Lord. Father, I pray that the quantity and the quality of our work would be forever changed because of who we serve, who we work for. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Guide us as we continue to seek you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, God wants to do something in your life. And if God's not... You don't see God working in your life, it's not his fault. Maybe we don't want to see it. Maybe we don't want to submit. So what I would ask you to do this morning is just to allow the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. You know, if you have a decision you want to make this morning, if there's something that is on your heart, I invite you to come and to make that decision. Maybe to be a part of this fellowship. Maybe to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe to ask Jesus to come into your heart for the very first time. Whatever it is that he is putting on your heart, I invite you to come. Maybe you want to come and pray. You know, this building was built for the worship of Almighty God. To bring glory and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ. This place right here was set up so that we could come and, and pray and intercede for others. Folks, our nation this country needs believers in Jesus Christ to cry out to humble themselves before the Lord and cry out so that we would see times of healing and refreshing our country is so divided we need such an act of God to bring healing to this and I think it would honor him for us as his people to get on our knees before him and pray. 
Pray for reconciliation. Pray for the salvation of souls. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for your brother, your sister, your children, your co-workers, your neighbors. Whatever he puts on your heart. I say when we stand to sing, you move, you go, and you do what he's asking you to do. Would you do that? Would you do that? You are here, 
You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing that again. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, sing it out. Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're turning. Lives around. I worship you. I worship you. And you are here. You're mending every heart. Oh, I worship you. Oh, I worship you. Oh, you are the way making miracle work. Promise keep it light in the darkness Cause my God, that is who you are You are the way maker, miracle work Promise keep it light in the darkness My God, that is who you are Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Cause even when I don't see it, you work, even when I don't feel it, you working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working, even when I don't feel it, you working, you never stop, you never stop working. Promise me. 
escape. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 And that is who you are. 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 Father, we thank you for being our way maker. In the midst of everything that we face, we know you will make a way. Father, I pray that we would work heartily as you call us to. That you would give us the strength. You would give us the courage. You would give us the heart to work heartily for you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time we've had. We just pray in your name. Amen. You guys may be Steve. Wow. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. I'm glad that he never stops working. That he's continuing on. I got just a couple announcements that I'll share with you. Uh, we have the baby bottle boomerang going on. Okay? These baby bottles that are out on the back table back there, they're for the Hope Pregnancy Center. And the idea is, is that you fill these bottles, take one, sign it out, bring it back. If you don't know where to put it, set it right there, okay? When you come in on Sunday morning, just put it right there. And over the next few weeks, between now and Father's Day, if you see baby bottles up here, maybe it'll help remind you to bring yours back, okay? But um, they're due back on uh, Father's Day. And, uh, you know, we are participating in sharing the gospel and spreading the hope of Jesus Christ in our community by supporting the Pregnancy Center. And what a blessing it is to do that. I would say this. You know, if you got these baby bottles, it's easier if you put the, the, the big checks in there first, you know, or the big bills, you put those in there first, and then you throw the change in on top of it. It makes it a lot easier. But um, Miss Casey wanted me to tell you about our, our uh, virtual family VBS. There's registration on our website at memorialchurch.us. If you go and register for that, you'll get a free T-shirt, okay? So do that. Um, those are for everybody that's registered by June 7th, okay? So you got about a week to register. Uh, they're going to have a packet pickup on June 27th, and then Vacation Bible School Week is going to be the 28th through June, July 2nd. And then we're going to have a family night where the entire church is invited to that family night on July 2nd at 6 p.m. But um, one last thing. You know, we all have the opportunity to give. And when we give, we are never more like our Father God than when we give. You know, the word says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Our Father is a giver. And we can be like him when we give. Now, when we give, we give to support the church to support the ministers now you need to understand something because of those who have gone before us we sit in a sanctuary that is paid for we are on a piece of property that is paid for so when we give we are supporting the ministers that go out in the different areas and share the gospel and, and, and minister to people all week long we are the church 24-7 365 days a year because wherever you go this church goes and so recognize when, when we talk about giving yeah we want to we want to give with an open hand because God can bless us he can take it press it down shake it together and and it'll be abundantly running over we think we can't give but everybody can give and God loves a cheerful giver 
You can give online. You can give through uh, the, the church app. You can text to give. Uh, there's a, there's a, a wood box in, the, in the, the foyer there that you can put it in there. Also, if you filled out one of these cards, these welcome cards, you can drop it in that little box. I do have one in here. I'm not just... There you go. If you filled out one of these, drop it in that box. But I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go. But I encourage you to live a generous life, not just giving here, but giving to those around, being a blessing to those we come in contact with. Let's pray. Loving Father, as we go from this place, I pray that you would just show us in real time those people in front of us to share our testimony with. Father, to, to have a word about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ ready on our lips so that when that opportunity comes, Father, that, that when we recognize it in real time, as they stand before us, Father, that we would give a faithful witness of what you have done in each one of our lives. Father, help us to live lives of generosity. Father, giving to others and being a blessing. Father, you, you have so blessed us to live in this country, to live in this state. Father, to be a part of this church family. Father, to be in the families that we are in. You have blessed us tremendously. So, Father, free us to go be a blessing to others. Father, we're going to be very careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for everything that you do in our lives. So guide us, bless us, and use us for your kingdom glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.